Welcome to Glio's uh, November 2023 Investing in Infrastructure Seminar. Uh, this is the panel on current themes in infrastructure investing. My name's Jim Wright. I'm the ma manager of the Premier Mighton Global Infrastructure Income Fund. And I'm joined by Henry Vota from Akia and Jags Walia from Van Longshot Kempen. Uh, so, um, firstly, before we proceed, do you guys just want to very, very briefly introduce yourselves? Uh, maybe starting with Jags. Hi, my name is Jags Walia. I'm a portfolio manager for over the last 28 years. And for the last five years, we've been running a global listed infrastructure fund here at Van Longshot Kempen. Henry? Yeah, thanks, Jim, for having us today. Um, my name is Henry Walter. Um, I'm working for Aquila Capital. I joined uh, the company in 2019. And before um, before that, I was working in the banking sector, and I'm responsible in Zurich, Switzerland, for my client group, which is um, banks, independent wealth managers, and foundations. So um, the I think the predominant theme in infrastructure investing both on the direct um, and on the listed infrastructure uh, side is is the energy transition and so um, firstly Jags um, starting with you how are you uh, what opportunities are you seeing uh, in that broad space at the moment and, and how are you looking at it going into 2024? Okay cool <clears throat> well it's obviously been you know, a really tough year for the renewables investments that's one part of the energy transition uh, with the energy transition, which if I just define it very broadly as make everything electric and then make the electricity green. On that second part of make the electricity green, you know, one way of doing that is renewables. Another way is coal to gas switching. And we've seen a lot of challenges this year, mainly in terms of renewables not having the power prices that they wanted to see. But, you know, we're seeing early signs of that, at least in the last one month of that being rectified. So, you know, I think there was an article in the FT about two weeks ago about the UK offshore wind farm auctions. The price will be you know, increased by 66 percent. So I think we're kind of coming out of that dark period of this year back on track for the longer term trend. And at least one of the things that were, you know, a headwind, which was the power prices is being fixed. And then, you know, there's another macro factor, which was bond yields, as you know, the kind of rates were moving up. That's always been a headwind for the utilities, which are doing a lot of the renewables. That's also starting to reverse from a headwind into a tailwind. So to be honest, feeling quite positive at this time of year going forwards. And, and Henry, um, Akila is obviously a, a specialist in, uh, in renewables. So um, what, um, what's your perspective on, on the current challenges and the current opportunities that, that we can see in that, in that broader um, energy transition space? Yeah, well, as you, as you um, said, Jim, um, we see ourselves as a decent investor in re renewable energy infrastructure. We do this since 2001, since the company was founded by two gentlemen who were still running the business. And um, the main idea of Aquila was and, and still is um, yeah, to contribute with the energy transition, decarbonization, and to offer also clients um, the opportunity to invest through us into renewable energy. So around 75% of the world's carbon emissions come from the energy sector. Um, so this is maybe one of the biggest um, puzzle pieces, so to say. And um, yeah, we see a lot of opportunities still uh, in, in the sector, even if this year was a challenging one, but an uh, infrastructure is still um, a very important asset class. And of course, the energy tran transition is one of the main um, issues, which is very important for humankind. So um, have a good um, feeling that we can still make it. And can I just add on to what Henry said? In terms of those puzzle pieces, I know, you know, we've been discussing this earlier, but you know, between the kind of the renewables and making everything green and making everything electric, there's always that other missing part of, you know, not forgetting to connect the two. So that'll be, you know, the grid infrastructure that, you know, is also a massive opportunity. Do, um, do you think that the EU uh, Repower Initiative, does that, does that really make a difference going forward in terms of smoothing the planning process um 
you know, accelerating the time from from plan to actual execution to commission. Is 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 this going to really make a difference to you know to something which has has been a challenge to um, to renewable developers and operators? Uh, who do you want to go first on that one? Jim? Well, I'd I'd love both of your views, um, Jags. Why don't you go first on this one? Okay, I'm going to say I really like obviously you know what the EU is doing and upping the ambition with this repower EU fit for fifty five. We need that, but sometimes you get this kind of overlap of, you know, politics and economics, which kind of, you know, sometimes aligns, sometimes it doesn't. And one of the places where it might not align, now we're not going to shoot ourselves in the foot, but we might slow down the progress, is if we're talking about accelerating the energy transition, but at the same time you start talking about rebuilding a green value chain in Europe, i.e., if we want to, you know, get to whatever renewables ambitions of 55% by 2030, but we also want a bigger component of what goes into renewables, you know, to be made in Europe, setting up a brand new supply chain like that actually does slow you down. You know, when we already kind of, you know, could get PVs and solar equipment from China quite easily, you know, obviously you've got to look at the supply chain risk in there and, you know, exactly what was in that supply chain. But this kind of, you know, adding this kind of national element onto like a renewable energy ambition to say, but I do need X percent to be made in the EU actually slows it down a little bit, even though you might be trying to raise your goals. Henry, I'll let you add to that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, Jack. So um, maybe to talk about um, some some numbers we just commissioned recently a meta study in Sakila, which was realized by the Possum Institute of Climate Impact Research and um, the main outcome was that we as you see we as Europe so to say still have a lot of cash reserves to um, to match our own set goals right so to bring some some numbers in um, it's surprisingly cheap um, we only had to invest 150 billion every year until 2030 and 100 billion every year until 2040 to achieve um, yeah, electricity independent uh, in, in Europe. So, and to put this into context, um, we spent about 792 billion um, from the Ukraine crisis in 2022 to protect um, us as consumer from, from these effects. So um, I think this shows that we have to turn words and commitments um, just into action. Otherwise, it's getting real, real tight for us to achieve these goals. And, it, and as we see, it's surprisingly cheap. And um, therefore, I, I think there's no other way. Yeah, and, Henry, and that's a great you... point. Sorry. Oh, I'm just going to say um, there's an overlap, you know, between energy transition and energy security. And I think, Absolutely. you know, yeah. And you know how we've seen sometimes you know at least over the last decade the a government's commitment towards energy transition can fade depending on you know who comes in and who comes out you know of power like you know we might see that in the white house again you know in a year from now but it seems to be that the you know a government's commitment to energy security seems a lot more you know pardon the pun bulletproof as in that really doesn't kind of go with one, you know, left or right kind of leaning government. But really, if it's an investment in renewables or in, you know, switching coal for gas because it's for energy security, that commitment is a lot more solid, you know, than kind of the, the wavering that we see on the energy transition side. Oh, look, that's exactly right. And we, we talk about the trilemma, don't we? You know, the security of supply. Um, uh, cost and then decarbonisation. These are the three sort of moving parts in an energy system. And and at any one time, the politicians, the um, the, the the regulators are looking probably at one more than the other two. And I think mm -hmm. that's exactly right. But but Henry, I wonder. You know, there's been some challenges to the. You know, it, it looked, you know, maybe if we go back two, three years, it looked like renewables were on an upward trajectory, you know, without any encumbrances. Um, what we've seen with supply chain issues, planning issues, and, and then, um, you know, particularly offshore wind, both in 
uh, in the North Sea and, you know, in the Northeast US, the Eastern Seaboard of the US, you know, we're, we're seeing challenges now. or We may be seeing that battle for the hearts and minds, which, you know, look to be pretty easy, becoming, you know, somewhat challenged. So is this something that, you know, you've you a, a question you get from your clients? Is this something you, you maybe think you, you need to kind of educate them on more? Um, or is it, you know, is is the still, do you think, an underlying broad consensus that we this is the direction of travel we need to go in? Um, well, first of all, I have to say that we are, um, regarding wind, we are, until now, still investing in onshore wind, um, solar PV and hydropower, and additionally, um, battery storage, energy efficiency to wind data centers. But of course, um, we saw some some challenges, like, I think this is also the topic with, with um with Jax, you mentioned um, the grid, you know, we have to connect this. We cannot only build some wind turbines, we only uh, we also have to take care of the grid and, um, and the interconnectors. So but in the last years, we also saw some challenges regarding rising interest rates and, uh, of course, some insecurity. And but, but I still see the asset class, clean energy infrastructure, renewable energy as a re really, really long term um, asset class. And we invest in the whole life cycle. So the only thing I can tell my investors is um, that um, we have that we still very very stable as a class, um, yeah, which is very long term. So which is a good idea um, to invest not only because of returns, also because of um, yeah the contribution to um, energy security and um, energy transition. And Jax, if we if we pivot to that point about the the grid investment because obviously you know we're going to have and and, and this is true in in the uk in, in in europe in the us in canada china anywhere we're going to have this sort of large scale electrification requires huge grid investments now do you think do you think the politicians and the regulators understand the extent to which this grid investment needs to come and also the extent to which, you know, if if we as infrastructure investors are going to invest in the companies that own the grid, we need mm -hmm. to get an adequate return? Yep, exactly. So uh, to very short answer that question, I don't think the politicians if they get it from their actions, you're not seeing enough on the action side. So maybe they get it and they're just slow in moving to address this problem. But there was a great report from the IEA. I think it was about a month or two ago. And it was beautiful. It was on the grid. And I think it was we have 80 million kilometers of grid today. And we actually need another 80 on top by 2040. Most of that being in emerging markets. So A, we needed more grid, but B, what you also need is you need better incentives for people to use the grid that we actually currently have. You know, so of this 80 million, if I've got a wind farm that's online 33% of the time, you know, then for the other two thirds, I'm not using my grid, which has just been built. So, you know, we really need actually better capacity payments for the grid to say the more you use it, the better incentivized, you know, you'll be to use it. And secondly, just incentives to actually get more grid built out. But, you know, the other problem is when you're building out grid, you really are, you know, you have right of way issues. It's going to be, you know, long distances you're traveling. So to get all those approvals just takes time. And I think I read in the IA report, like your average grid is going to be 10 to 15 years to get built, whereas your renewable project might be five years. And, you know, I think even at the moment we have, more renewables actually built than we have grid capacity. So, you know, the grids have to catch up. If the incentives were there, we would be able to see that catch up right now because you'd have a 10 year lead time. You know, the incentives are not there and we're not seeing, you know, that kind of grid investment happening. We need it, but now we need the incentives to actually make it real. So that's what we're kind of really, you know, waiting on happening. And and Henry, you know, when when you invest and you, you laid out what, um, a killer um, focuses on, you know, are, are you seeing grid as uh, grid access as one of the major kind of impediments, delays to investment? And, and is this something that you feel, you know, will improve or do you think this is going to be a challenge throughout the rest of this decade? 
Well, to be honest, um, I'm not a grid expert. I'm, I'm more the, the renewable energy expert. But of course, we um, we cannot ignore the grid and the connection. I mean, this is like, like Jack said, we really need this as well because um, even if we are talking about electrification, the I mean, we have to make sure that the electricity does not come out of the wall, right? It comes from from somewhere, and of course, the um, connection has to be there. But I have a good feeling that um, if we can show some proof of concept that it works out, then we also can. Um, build the um, the grid because um, I mean the renewable energy assets are there we are, we for example are building this and maybe um, I'm totally agree Drax um, because you mentioned also politicians has to yeah have to turn words and commitments into um, into action and uh, maybe to give an example I have to take a look at my cheat sheet because it's really recent news um, for example Portugal just ran entirely on renewable energy um, for for six days this year. They um, generated 1,200 gigawatts of renewable energy. Um, it was between end of October, beginning of November, and um, it was a new record the last time it was um, in 2019. So we still see improvement. And um, now they are among the 20 best prepared um, nations regarding the energy transition. And if we see such yeah, proof of concepts, um, so to say, um, yeah, it makes me believe that also politicians see that. And um, also believe in that, and therefore take more into action. I think we we need examples that this works out. And if you can show this, like Portugal does, then um, yeah, I have of, I am of good hope, so to say. Okay. Yeah, and Jim, you said you know whether the grid was an impediment. I think it's probably more of a consideration. You know that you need to know when I have this opportunity to invest in renewables. The last thing people want to see on the renewable side is a stranded asset. Like we always assume stranded assets, that's for fossil fuels for later, you know, or sooner. But you don't want to see stranded assets on the renewable side. So the grid question is a consideration more than an, you know, um, impediment, I would say. Okay, now I have to ask, so if we if we think about energy transition, and, and obviously, theoretically, I think we'd all like 100% zero carbon, renewable um, uh, energy system but um, to what extent do you do you guys think that's realistic to what extent does storage evolve to achieve that goal and, and obviously you know I think we're probably all investors in storage but um, it feels like at the moment short-term energy storage is is very doable but longer term you know, over two, three days when there's yeah. the, the wind isn't blowing, it's very, very cold, <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and the sun isn't uh, the the sun isn't shining. You know, is is there still a place for gas in the energy mix going forward, or or do you feel that that you know, investing in 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 gas as a fuel in gas fired you know power stations is is probably you know only well, risks stranded assets in in Jag's words. So, so Henry, what's your what's your sense of that? Mm, yeah, maybe I could put uh, the example of Portugal in place again. They were shut down um, the last um, gas power plants in down in twenty twenty one, which is nine years ahead of their own set goals. So, so I think um, it's still doable, and uh, I think sixty eight percent of the generated electricity. Um, this year came from renewable energy. So of, of course, this is, it's not doable from one day to, the, to another. But I think in the long term, we should try to, to achieve um, yeah, the generation of electricity from nearly only renewable energy. So battery storage, as you said, Jim, is, is a very, very important topic. I, can, I cannot give you a, a number. Um, but what I can tell from our side is that we are at the moment checking every renewable asset um, regarding reprioritization with a with a um, storage asset as well. So I think uh, battery storage is one of the yeah biggest topics we have to um, focus on. And are, and are you encouraged by the cost curve in terms of battery storage? Is it is is that storage coming the the price of that storage coming down meaningfully, or do you think um, we're not quite there yet? Mm. Please, Jacks, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, oh, yeah, on the battery side, we've seen battery storage costs, you know, 
collapsed like by about 50% in the last two years. But I don't think that's because of any great battery breakthrough. It's just a short-term oversupply. I.e. in China, you expected electric vehicle demand to grow by this much. It's been growing less than that as you remove subsidies. So we've just got a short-term oversupply of batteries that's caused you know, this kind of cyclical price drop. I don't think at the moment we're seeing a breakthrough enough that it's going to you know, justify the halving. But on your question, Jim, I think there was three in there on kind of, yeah, but the energy transition, you know, not to kind of, you know, be too down on this, but I think we're going to significantly miss all of our climate goals. You know, so the whole Paris Agreement of trying to halve your CO2 by 2030, I mean, you know, in the last eight years, CO2, I think, has gone up by about 10% globally instead of being going down. So I think we're on track to miss everything, you know, every goal that we've set. Very unfortunate. But in terms of the role of gas, it's been demonstrated. We see it in the US and we're seeing it being worked on in China as we speak, that gas is the enabler. It is the transition fuel, but it's actually it's enabling renewables because until you get longer term battery storage, like today we got like four or five hours, that's fine. You know, if I like, you know, if the sun goes down, it hasn't come up today because I'm in Holland. But if it had gone down at five, you'd be OK till about 10 p.m. But so we don't have enough battery storage hours, so that's not going to help us. So until that breakthrough, gas is the one that facilitates, you know, basically the intermittency that you're getting from renewables. And, you know, also we've seen in the US as a, you know, positive spin-off from the shale revolution was they just switched away from coal in power generation towards gas. That will more than halve your CO2 emissions there. China's trying to do the same thing. So, you know, the role of gas is either replacing coal or the backup that enables renewables until one day we get, you know, battery technology that's more than just a few hours. It's got a quite a solid role, I would say, for the decades to come. Yeah, maybe to add on, maybe to add on this, um, I see gas only as an interim solution, uh, Mr. Sajak. So we cannot, um, yeah, rely on gas for the next decades. I think we don't have the time for that. And as an interim solution, maybe better than coal, for example. Yeah, yep. it, it, yeah, it could sure. get worse, right? Yeah. And yeah. Um, <laughs> we need to get yeah. we need to get the battery storage. Um, yeah, to, to the point that we can rely. For example, during the night on battery storage, and uh, this is a very specific topic, um, which is um, different from each country to to each country, of course. Yeah. And yeah. Um, maybe coming from the value side, um, within the last year, from speaking from from our side, we saw a lot of increase in the value of of battery storages. So I think even for investors, a good thing yeah. to invest. Yeah. And um, of course, regard. I mean, putting the um, electricity curves into place. In, in a long in a long term view um, infrastructure um, but please correct me if I, if you have another opinion on that Drax, but i i would doubt it <laughs> so in a long yeah. in a long term infrastructure is always a very stable investment and, and it contributes um, to the energy security so i think it's it's a no brainer to invest um, in a specific amount of the portfolio location in such infrastructure yeah i agree and also we're getting additional regulatory support you know so if we talk about solar plus battery together, I mean, that is just, that's ticking all the right boxes for collecting your Inflation Reduction Act benefits, you know, from the US side on those tax credits. So, you know, as much as we like infrastructure, the additional regulation we've seen just makes it even more attractive. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, I think we're uh, we're coming to end, the end of our time. So I'm just gonna ask one Final left field question for both of you: um, Where does nuclear power fit into the uh, the the energy transition mix? And and do you think that um, in five ten years time we'll be looking at small modular nuclear reactors as as a as um again an enabler of that transition to zero carbon? So um, I'm going to ask Jags that first. OK, so on our side, we clearly see the role of nuclear in getting us towards the energy transition. You know, if your main problem is CO2, then nuclear has none of that. And then obviously every round of regulation makes the safety standards stricter as we kind of, you know, see the fallout, no pun intended, of, you know, having like a nuclear accident and you need to tighten safety measures. So that's all, you know, going in the right way. Then obviously we have the storage issue that we know about, but I'd rather have a storage issue than a global warming issue. 
you know, and in the world we live in, you've got to choose the best options on the table, you know, not something that isn't on the table. But in terms of, you know, the talk around getting to more modular reactors, I don't think in the next five or 10 years, you know, the, the, the nuclear industry doesn't have a good track record in making a breakthrough quickly and then making it commercial as well. Things are always slower. They always go like, you know, worse than you kind of expected. So I would, you know, I'd hope within 20 years we get to that modular reactor size, you know, and that's scalable, but not in the five to 10. I think that's just too optimistic given that industry's track record. And Henry, will we see a cooler investing in, uh, in nuclear? <laughs> No, uh, I can okay. definitely, uh, I can definitely say no. We're not investing in nuclear power and also not in gas or in coal. So we have only focusing on our main expertise, which is nuclear energy. But um, no, I hold the view that uh, nuclear power cannot be seen as a sustainable investment or as a sustainable um, generation of electricity because of the um, storage problem. We still don't have a solution for the storage. And of course, in terms of emissions, it might be might be more sustainable like a coal plant. But um, I don't think that uh, that it's a good idea to buy, to build new nuclear power plants for several reasons. For the first one is again that we don't have a solution for the storage, and the second is it takes way longer time to build a new nuclear power plant than to build a wind farm or solar PV par um, farm park. So um, from coming from this perspective, I would um, yeah, better count on renewables or battery storage and um, not to build new nuclear power plants. We don't have to shut down everyone, every every nuclear power plant tomorrow. Um, better to run these than, than coal plants, of course. But within the next years and next decade, we should um, definitely also try to substitute those. Great. Well, look, thank you very much. Hopefully, um you found it interesting our uh, our viewers have found it interesting so thank you to the panelists and uh, thank you very much for watching